halfway. Turn your Bibles, please, to Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. As we continue studying through this gospel account, this <clears throat> the over, overarching theme we've given is the gospel in action. It is Peter's memoirs, we believe, written by Mark. And the story that Peter wants to tell is to get us to the cross as quickly as possible. So his gospel account is um, briefer than the others. It does not take up the birth narrative and genealogy information. Jesus bursts on the scene as the coming one, the Messiah. And today, in these brief verses, just for a few minutes, I want us to think about this topic, don't be a Pharisee. We've already encountered these fellows in chapter 7 and seen what they can do, at least what they try to do. And Jesus exposed them there, which only angered them more. And so we have another encounter here today, and I want us to, to use this to look at what, what they were there for, to consider what a Pharisee is, and then to use this as a check on our lives, that we not be one. Because I could have entitled this Confessions of a Former Pharisee. I even thought about the title, Mamas, Don't Let Your Babies Grow Up to Be Pharisees. But, I, but it seems to, uh, don't be a Pharisee, says it enough, all right? Mark 8, verses 11 to 13, if you would stand with me and follow along in your Bibles. If you don't have your Bible, we have the text on the screen for you, not at all meant to substitute for the Scripture, but in case you don't have your copy of the Scriptures with you today. If you don't have a Bible and you want one, see me afterwards. We can make that happen. The Pharisees came and began to argue with him, seeking from him a, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why does this generation seek a sign? Truly I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. And he left them, got into the boat again, and went to the other side. It's very brief, but we've read what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. We read it pages today. Think about this. Commit <laughs> to not be a Pharisee. Thank you. Be seated. You see, I was a Pharisee. I was raised in a home by a godly mother and a religious hypocrite for a father. He was a Pharisee. I was the son of a Pharisee. And I became a Pharisee. Was very religious, very active, very involved. All those things are good. I've told you before that uh, a few years ago, maybe still have them. I don't know. A few years ago, we we're cleaning out some of the little jewelry boxes that you accumulate through the years, and and I found a couple of my 100% attendance pins that I was given. I, I had not missed a Sunday. Now, to be fair, I had not bounded out of bed every Sunday morning rushing down the street to church. My mother had to fight me and drag me. She should have gotten the pen, truth be known. She was the one that got me there, but I, got, I had it. And I was proud of it. Scripture memory awards. Bible drill achievements. Very religious. Billy the Baptist. Professed faith at 10, baptized, I think that night. Living 10 years as Pharisees do. Externally appearing to keep all the rules. Internally breaking them or sidestepping them or justifying not keeping them. Because after all, I was so 
devoted to God, surely he would cut me some slack in some of these areas. So it was a shock to my, uh, he was associate pastor, youth minister, when at the age of 20, I confessed faith in Christ to the church I was growing up in and said, I've been living a lie. This is near and dear to me. Because I saw what a Pharisee could do. I saw, I saw a man who, in his private life, could just act like the devil incarnate and then step into public life, into church life, and pray eloquent prayers and teach Sunday school, get elected a deacon. I was groomed by my father to be a Pharisee. Thank God my mother was fighting on her knees for my soul. So it's important to keep in mind when you study the life of Jesus Christ that he was betrayed and given over to be executed by the most religious people of his day, the Sanhedrin, the scribes and the Pharisees. The Pharisees have been described as a religious sect active in Palestine during the New Testament period. In the Gospel accounts, the Pharisees come across as Jesus' antagonists, as they did in chapter 7 of Mark, and again here in chapter 8. They pushed morality in the name of Yahweh, but it was a type of morality where they were, they were the guardians of morality, not always the practitioners of morality, if you understand that. They defended Judaism, which was right. But oftentimes the means that they used to defend Judaism was not right. In other words, they did not use the weapons of warfare given to the people of God. Prayer, memorization of scripture, fasting, singing praise to God. They didn't, they used carnal weapons. Not all the Pharisees were this way, to be fair. Nicodemus, who comes at night so that his fellow Pharisees would not discover what he had done and see him as a traitor. Joseph of Arimathea, who when all was said and done, he and Nicodemus came into the light to say, we want the body of Jesus. Not all the Pharisees were bad people. In fact, I would say to you that the Pharisees did not intend to be bad people. That's, this is the mystery. Of, this, is the, this is the challenge of it all to me. But they were at once admired by the people and at the same time despised by the people. Because the Pharisees would set the standard so high that no mere man, no no common human being would ever attain to the standard and the best they could do was simply hope that maybe their children would become Pharisees. Because the Pharisees in the minds of the common population had it all together. They knew all the answers. They figured out a lot of the riddles and the mysteries. They imparted teaching, wisdom and blessing upon the people or warned them of curses. And so when they would set their snares for Jesus, it was the expectation of the crowd that they would capture him like a bird in a net, like they had done to other false messiahs, as they would call them. Other self-appointed, self-anointed rabbis 
You see, the Pharisees were very suspicious and judgmental of anyone who did not come from their schools. Jesus was a troublemaker to them. He was a blasphemer to them. Some say you can tr trace back this Pharisaic Judaism to the days of Ezra. And this is what was called the scribal movement of the 5th century B.C. Some say it's a little nearer in the Maccabean revolt of 167 B.C. The, the guardians of Judaism rise up. Some say that you can read the wisdom of Joshua ben Sirach, known in the Apocrypha as Ecclesiasticus, and you can see Phariseeism in its incipient form. Wherever you find it, there's a picture portrayed by them, and I would say a picture embraced by the, by the masses, that these were the faithful ones. So Phariseeism became a synonym for faithfulness. Anyone who was not in that, that elite crowd was not faithful. And then Jesus comes along. You recall in Mark 7 that we read a few weeks ago how they complained to Jesus that his disciples didn't follow the regulations. Because you see, the Pharisees, not only in their own minds, earnestly defended the moral law summarized in the Ten Commandments, they also developed all of these oral traditions that were in their minds further explanations of it, uh, applications of it, inferences of it, and it became a, a body of material. It was, it, was, it was sort of like the IRS tax code. Nobody really understood what it said, and so it could be used against people anytime they wanted to this oral tradition that developed. Jesus accused them of making traditions, their traditions that they had developed, making that equal to doctrine. So I want us to see in this passage today, as, we, as, I, as I challenge myself, because I've been there and I don't want to go back there, we'll say a little more about that, and I challenge you, in case you, let's cut to the chase. Everybody has a Pharisee in his heart somewhere wanting to get out. Our challenge is to put him to death on the cross of Jesus Christ. So look at this passage with me along three thoughts. First of all, the driving force of Phariseeism. Secondly, the withering effect of Phariseeism on true spirituality. Third, when it comes to Phariseeism, just walk away, all right? Let's see this here. First of all, the driving force of Phariseeism. In verse 11, the Pharisees came and began to argue with him, mark, mark that word argue, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. So we're not even left to wonder what was the driving force here. Did they come to, to him to learn? No, they came to argue. One of the marks of Phariseeism is a quick willingness that almost looks like a, a joyous experience of arguing over spiritual things. If you've read anything about the Pharisees, you know that there was, there was some of them who would argue over how many angels could dance on the head of a needle. It was someone used the term arguing, arguing early and late. If a line was crooked, he'd argue it straight. Loved a good argument. I've known people like that. In fact, there's a, I've referenced a friend of mine. I'm not going to get too specific because these sermons do go out on sermon audios <laughs> in case he listens in. But he, 
He loved to argue, loves, loves to argue with people. And would call me and say, boy, I tell you, I gave it to this fellow today. Well, you would like to think you, you gave him the gospel? No, I showed him how stupid he was and how wrong he was about this, that, and the other. And you just, my head begins to drop and I'm, I'm thinking, please, please don't tell that fellow you know me. They came to argue with him. Not only that, though, they were seeking, requesting this sign, not because they'd heard about the other signs and they themselves were, were, were desirous to see the power of Jesus. In fact, some of them had seen the power of Jesus. They'd seen people who had leprosy, once had leprosy, now cleansed, healed. They, people with withered hands who now had the use of their hands, with, with crippled legs, now walking. They'd seen these things. When a great miracle occurred in a person's life, they were to report to the, to the synagogue or to the temple and, and show themselves. It wasn't because they were students. And I think that's another mark here. A Pharisee doesn't think he needs to learn. Brothers and sisters, I want you to understand something. I don't want to wake up the morning that I'm not willing to learn something about the nature of God, the Word of God, the nature of man, the issues with my own remaining sin, the glory of Christ. I don't want to wake up that morning. Pharisees are not interested in learning. They're only interested in teaching. They wanted a sign from heaven to test him. And the word test is, I think, the same word that's used when we're told that the, that, that the devil carries Jesus into the wilderness to tempt him. They were, they were constantly looking to find Jesus in, in something that they could identify as sin and expose him as a sinner. Now, if that was something somebody wants to do with me, that won't take very long. Okay? That won't take very long. But to do that to Jesus, it was not going to happen. And every time they tried to trip him up, put him in a situation where if he gave any, any answer he gave would put him at odds with the Word of God, which is the greatest commandment, they asked him. Well, if you choose one over the other nine, you don't win. So we're told what the driving force of Phariseeism is. It is to argue and it is to trip people up. They would come out with implications of the law that no common man would have ever thought of. Remember I told you about their their Sabbath regulations, the fourth commandment says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall you labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, and it goes down and tells it, no one in your household shall do any work. Not even the animals shall work. All right, so it's pretty clear that the fourth commandment forbade using that day of rest in the same way you use the other six days. It was just against God's heart and his law. So they would do this. They determined in one of their regulations that it was sinful to travel past a certain distance on the Sabbath. The Pharisees typically were people who, who were better off financially than the average person among the Jews was. They had the means to do something to circumvent their, their own tradition about how far you could travel on the Sabbath day before it was considered doing work. So they would send ahead of time, if they had plans to travel on that day, they would send ahead of time their servants to set a, a change of clothes and a meal in certain places at certain intervals because they also had defined traveling from your domicile. You can only move so far from your domicile that a domicile was a place where you had a change of clothes and a meal. And so they could, they could do, go pretty much within reason anywhere they wanted to go on the Sabbath because 
Their own stipulations, they had arranged a way to go around them. See, Pharisaism has a double standard. It's what I am allowed to do or forbidden to do, and it's what you are allowed to do and forbidden to do. And the yoke was always heavier on you. They were masters at finding fault in others, but not so keen to find fault in themselves. It is a pretty amazing moment when in the discussion of how they should crucify Jesus or, or should they put him to death, Gamaliel opens up his heart a little bit, just briefly. He says, if this thing is from God, we can't stop it. Pharisees didn't typically think like that. The driving force was not a righteous one. Secondly, the withering effect of Phariseeism on true spirituality. Jesus' response to the Pharisees' inquiry is very telling. The first thing he does is he heaves a great sigh. Sighing deeply in his spirit. And he asks, why do you seek a sign? I'm going to tell you, no sign will be given to this generation. Now Matthew fleshes this in a little more in his account. Peter wants us to know, in his telling of this here by way of Mark, that that you don't, Jesus is not some big dispenser that you come to and say, miraculously provide a meal, and he does. Miraculously do this, and on demand, he, he's not your pet rabbi who does tricks on demand. That's what Peter's driving home here. Matthew fills it in a little bit when Jesus says, no sign, the only sign this generation is going to get is the sign of Jonah. That when he was in the belly of the fish, the great fish, three days, three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the belly of the earth. In other words, you Pharisees who know the Old Testament frontwards and backwards ought to understand what Jonah was about. A sign will come of death, burial, and resurrection. Phariseeism, the asking questions for motives that are not righteous, asking questions to ensnare people, asking questions to expose your brilliance over someone else's ignorance, asking questions so that people will feel inferior to your superiority is withering. You see, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ flourishes when it's filled with inquiring students. Not when it's filled with inquiring Pharisees. Pharisees want to split hairs and nuances and I remember when I first came here a couple of folks stick out in my mind who approached me not any of you so don't just, just relax just, whew, okay. saying now you said such and such when you preached and I, that's not really exactly I, you need to be more specific in this and the other and believe me I'm, I'm never above and beyond correction but the point that was being made was uh, you want to go Really? Really, that's what was all important? That nuanced aspect that was not the focus of the text or of the sermon? In other words, I didn't, I didn't run and embrace your shibboleth. I didn't mount your hobby horse. That's what Pharisees look for. And it's a, it's a withering 
it has its withering effect on true spirituality. It will, it will all but kill the spirituality of the person who is the Pharisee. Because he begins to live deceiving himself. He lives one way in his own thought world, in his own heart world, and sometimes those actions manifest themselves behind, behind closed doors in the dark. And then he's another way in public. And people feed that. People, people would say to me, and say to my mother in front of me, Marzell, I know you must be proud of your son. Well, of course, as I got older, she had more struggles with me. But, but you see, growing up, Marzell, I know you must be proud of your son. And I think in my own legalistic heart, yeah, she should be. Pharisaism. Killing. It turns devotion into duty. It takes you away from the gospel, not toward it. Third, when it comes to Pharisaism, just walk away. Notice, after Jesus says, why does this generation, why do you want a sign? Why, why is not the teaching, the, the communication of the truth that I give? And why is not your, being able to look on someone else who's had a great impact on their lives, a healing impact, why is it not enough? Why has it always got to be about you? Give us a sign. Do this for us. You see, I would submit to you that James and John had in their hearts a Pharisee living there. So they come to Jesus and say, Master, we want, look at this, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Now, will you agree to that first? Before we ask it, will you agree that whatever we ask you will do? That's a, that's a, that's a typical pharisaical snare. We want to sit on your right hand and left hand. We, we're happy to be a part of the 12, but really we think we're cut above. We don't have some of the issues those fellows have. So Jesus, after answering them, no sign will be given to this generation. Understanding the exception that Matthew adds in his gospel account. After this, and he left them. Got into the boat again, went to the other side. When it comes to Phariseeism, walk away. Because the best thing you can do is to, is to embrace the gospel in front of them. Ideally, two are better than one, and a threefold cord is not easily broken. We know that when it comes to, to that, if it's just you and the wilting, withering experience of Phariseeism, remove yourself from it. Because in time, it will wear you down. In time, you will, you will find that it's easier to keep a list of rules and regs than it is to examine yourself to whether or not you're in the faith, to search your own heart, to lay an ax at the root of your remaining sin, to cut it out, to do what you do out of love for God and love for others, to trust only, exclusively, completely in the finished work of Jesus Christ as the way by which you are saved, it's easier to just come up with a list and check them off. But it's deadly. It's deadly. Jesus could very well stand his ground and encounter the Pharisees. And I, I don't know except for maybe Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus that he convinced any of them otherwise. He could have taught them as no one ever taught. He could have exposed their motives. He finished saying what he had to say and got in the boat and went to the other side. Because you see, folks, Phariseeism is deadly. It's deadly for the person who, who is snared by it. It's deadly for those influenced by a Pharisee. Because say what you will, about the glorious, triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. 
riding on a young colt with palm branches thrown in front of him and people's outer cloaks thrown in front of him as a, as a picture of royalty. Here, royalty has come to this city. It's, but the Pharisees were able to convince a number of those people just a few days later that he needed to be crucified. Phariseeism can be that destructive. It will destroy that which is spiritually good and, and claim that it was doing a favor to God to do it. The man born blind in John chapter 9 is excommunicated from the synagogue because he dares say, this man Jesus gave me sight. Now, real quickly, how not to be a Pharisee. First thing is to consume healthy doses of the gospel on a regular basis, a daily basis. Sometimes if you're, if you're really steeped in this stuff, in this, in this legalistic uh, hypocrisy, hourly doses. We need to remind one another of the gospel. When we're getting too big for our own britches, we pray to God, somebody comes along and reminds us of the gospel. The Roman generals, the, the better Roman generals were smart enough to know that when they came back from having conquered a people, that it would go to their heads if they weren't careful. And so they, in their chariots, they placed a lowly, I think it was a squire, or whatever his title was, and his responsibility was to whisper in the ear of the conquering Roman general when the Roman general would ride into the city, many times dragging the kings he had deposed, dragging them behind his chariot. This young person's responsibility was to whisper, glory is fleeting. It only lasts for a little while. Thank God when somebody reminds you of the gospel. When you're, in, when you're inclined to strut about what you've done, all you've done, someone says, you know, Jesus in Luke 17 said, they were supposed to say, I'm just an unworthy servant. I've, I've only done what was required of me to do. Thank God when somebody reminds you of the gospel when you get down in the dumps and, and you, you fall victim to the lies of the enemy who tells you you're not good enough to be saved. Look, no saved person would say what you just said. No saved person would do what you just did. And he, he beats you over the head and he wearies you. And pitch you. Thank God when somebody comes along and says, but remember, this isn't about you. Jesus Christ died and rose again for you. Your penalty for sin was taken upon, he took it upon himself. He was punished for you. He rose from the grave. There's no enemy you have. Sin, death, hell, the grave cannot accuse you, cannot capture you, cannot draw you away from God. Nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Thank God when somebody tells us again about the gospel. But if you don't have somebody around you, you and I have got to learn daily to remind ourselves to live as Christ, to die as gain. Also, remember what God did to save you. He sent His only Son. It's a big deal. You didn't get saved partially by what Jesus did and partially by what you did or didn't do or are doing or will do. You got saved completely and exclusively because of who Jesus Christ is and what He came to do for you. Salvation was not your idea. The way of salvation is not your idea. It's God's. Remember what you were before God saved you. Now, some of you were just, you were just utter scoundrels. I mean, you, your life was just, it was, it was hellacious. But not all of you. Some of us knew how to cover it up better than others. God saved me from the most dangerous drug that's ever been developed. Dead religion. Dead religion. Finally, don't look down on someone as if they do not deserve the grace and mercy of God. Don't look down at some poor person, some person caught in just gross sin, people different than you are. Don't look down on those folks as if they don't deserve the grace and mercy of God. Because brothers and sisters, 
We don't deserve the grace and mercy of God. If God had simply been acting on justice between himself and me, he would have destroyed me in front of people and struck fear and terror. But you see, God operates on the principle of justice between himself and his son. And for the sake of his son, he would not destroy me. For the sake of his son, he would have me born in a home where a mother would sweetly tell me about Jesus. Raised in a church setting where people told me about Jesus. Not let me continue the lie, but expose me. And, and I, I didn't hear the voice in the room, but it was as if when I said, Lord, what do you want from me? And he said, your righteousness is filthy rags to me. Don't be a Pharisee. You see, it's, it's easy to be one because one lives in our hearts. And if we don't proactively, intentionally take steps to crucify that rascal to the cross, he will grow up and he will take charge. And it'll be all about religion, all about what I believe and how you believe differently. And my belief is superior to yours be all about that and not about grace and mercy and love and patience and long suffering and tenderness and peace the Pharisees often were not interested in any of those really but then it was all about being right and you being wrong don't be a Pharisee Continue trusting in Jesus Christ. Remind yourself every day of who he is and what he came to do for you. And had he not done that, then you would be, you'd be lost to this day, un, 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 unsaved to this day, had it not been for Jesus. And then when you look upon others and reach out to others, look at them as Jesus would do. He wept. There were people like sheep without a shepherd. He wept because they hurt so much. He, he was tenderly touched with their infirmities. That's, that's, how we will, that's how we will respond when we're evangelical servants of Christ and not pharisaical defenders of religion. Let's pray.